Okay, so um, the uh, meeting of the June 7th, 2021 Faculty Senate meeting will come to order. There are just a couple of um, housekeeping items that I want to bring your attention to. I've done this spiel a number of times, so um, hopefully <laughs> it's not new to you. Uh, but uh, if you would uh, like to uh, hold the floor, if you'd like to be recognized, or you need to be recognized first before you can hold the floor. And um, in order to do so, you need to raise your hand. Uh, and then um, once you are recognized, state your name and your college. Um, if uh, you do not wish to speak, but still wish to state a, an opinion or ask a question, you may do so in the chat. Um, but do know that um, I uh, call on folks who raise their hand first. Um, if uh, you are uh, not speaking or, and when you are done speaking, please mute your microphone. Um, and lastly, uh, folks will be um, recognized and can speak on any one motion two times, but you may not be recognized a third time. Um, and I think that is it. I think that might be it. So uh, the minutes of the May 10th Senate meeting have been distributed as a link in your agenda. Are there any corrections or additions to the May minutes? Okay, hearing no corrections or additions, the minutes are approved as written. So next we'll hear a report from President Key. Thank you very much, and I'm going to try to be short. First of all, um, I apologize. You can see I have had a uh, I've had a uh, little basal cell surgery today, and um, uh, someone thought that I was Van Gogh. I tried to cut my ear off, but no, it was just simply uh, over at the medical center. So, um, first of all, let me just uh, note that uh, this has been a tumultuous year. I think we all recognize that, and uh, it's been one where I applaud um, all of you for your diligence and the good work that you've done, but I also want to particularly applaud uh, uh, Natalie, um, who has done just an excellent job. Um, and this is her last uh, official meeting as chair of our faculty uh, senate, and um, I would be really remiss if I did not again remind all of you that she did not come to this position with any knowledge of the fact that she's going to have to uh, help transition our university through a, uh, through a pandemic. Um, and the other members of uh, our team, Emily, um, and, and obviously Roy Nutter, who, by the way, I want to acknowledge this is Roy's uh, last time in his particular role. Roy has been active in the university from the time that he came here. Roy was active um, as, a, as a member of, uh, of our faculty leadership um, some 40 years ago when I was here the first time around and a uh, small world that Roy Nutter's uh, daughter and my daughter were in the same class and, and we're very close friends. So it, it shows that the world is, uh, continues to move forward. Um, in, term, in terms of where we are right now, um, we continue to work on our big projects. Um, the big projects obviously being um, the transition and transformation of the university, and I know the provost would talk about that. Uh, we're focusing obviously on student retention and student life. Um, we have uh, good news there. Our numbers uh, continue to get better and stronger, and uh, certainly our retention rates are something that we're very concerned about. Um, turned about, uh, you, you know, we're, we're going to really be able to pivot again to take a look at that. Uh, the culture and the, of, of, of our university and uh, how we deal with our human resources and our human values uh, always critical and, and particularly after the kind of year that we've all been through. I, I take a lot of pride having talked to a number of my colleagues around the country in the fact that uh, I think that we fared better than most uh, and, um, and the net result I think has been uh, positive for us as an institution. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, we work on our big projects, uh, other big projects, such as uh, the Hyperloop and our research center programs and working with the federal government. Obviously the state government is in, um, is in uh, interims today uh, or is in a special session today. And so we're working to make certain that we sustain and, 
increase the funding for the institution. And uh, those are all issues that I think this summer are going to be important. Uh, we are going to be, we're going to have, I think twice if uh, Emily and uh, Natalie and as you remind me, but I think we're going to do two, uh, two country roads tours with faculty uh, uh, members um, to, to get people to see our state, its beauty, uh, the beauty of its people, the beauty of, uh, and, the, and the significance of opportunity. I think that sometimes we can live in a, uh, we can live in a bubble as, as members of a university community and not realize that there's so much more for uh, that this institution does and so much service that it provides. So I think that, uh, that I think that would be a, a wonderful effort. My intent is to uh, to commence my 55 county tours. Some of our newer members of the Senate may not know, but I try every year to at least be in every county in the state and um, do most of it in the summer in a van. And uh, uh, and uh, it's it's and last summer we were not able to do it. And I think that. Um, the ability to be able to get out and meet people in their in their home communities, uh, including legislative leaders, uh, has always proven to be very useful. So we have much in front of us. Um, I feel very confident about where we will be in the fall. Um, you know, the numbers. Uh, if, if we take a look at the virus, I just talked to our healthcare people a, a few minutes ago. Again, um, you know, the numbers are going through the roof. Uh, or through the floor, excuse me, um, uh, dramatically, um, the uh, the results the the results of the vaccine uh, is that uh, you you have a ninety over ninety nine point nine percent surety that if you take a vaccine that you will not get the virus, and so obviously we continue to urge everyone to take the vaccine, um, and we also. Um, Note that uh, the incentive, uh, the incentives that we have tried to institute both in the state and uh, and um, and within the university uh, seem to seem to have had a positive impact. So, Madam Chairman, that is my report, and I thank you for the opportunity to uh, work with you. Thank you. Uh, are there questions for the president? I see. Oh, it's an attendee hand. I don't think it's a senator hand. I did see one hand go up. It looks like they would like to be promoted to a panelist. Okay. Uh, hearing no uh, questions, we will move on to our report from Provost Reed. Thank you, Natalie. Um, okay, I don't know what's going on. There's something about a spotlight. Am I being recorded, Natalie? Is that what's going on? Um, everybody's strange. It says remove spotlight. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, let's just start out chronologically. We wrapped up the school year with our May commencement, our first live commencement um, in one and a half years. Nearly 4,500 graduates marched in four separate ceremonies on Mountaineer Field. And everything pretty much went off without a hitch, um, you know, considering this was our first uh, commencement to stadium in as long as I can remember. So um, we know that our graduates and their parents seem to be very happy to, to be able to come to campus for commencement. So that was, a, that was a success. Summer school is well underway. We're beginning the third week of the first summer session. And again, it's a mix of, um, in camp, on campus and uh, online instruction. Our enrollment is down about 5% from last year for summer school, but our first May semester went very well. Um, that is of course over now that we're in June. Um, after ad drop, we had 442 students uh, enrolled in 27 classes. And the early feedback has been good. And again, this appears to be the shorter um, terms seem to be of high interest to our students, particularly when they are close to um, the semester. Uh, we are um, piloting a summer bridge program based on an idea that came out of this Senate uh, from a couple of faculty members. And I asked, uh, I'm asking Evan Winters if he is here to just give a brief update on where we are with that. Evan? Sure, thank you, Marianne. Hope you're all having a 
a good summer and enjoying the warm weather. Uh, summer Bridge, as, as, as the provost uh, mentioned, uh, came out of initiatives out of the Faculty Senate, uh, a number of members of which who were concerned that our students hadn't had much of a um, of a real high school experience, academic experience in high school uh, during their senior year, and it might be unprepared for the rigors of college study. Um, so uh, in conjunction with, with the faculty center, senators, we decided to launch a pilot and attempt to give students um, who we viewed as being, oh, in, in some extent, uh, perhaps at risk, um, a chance to you know take an online class, get a sense of what um, courses are like at a university and what kind of skill sets um, they need to succeed in those courses. So this week, uh, we're going to start registration. Communications will go out probably Wednesday, I think, and then we'll start registering uh, students. We have a website built. Uh, we have five sections, academic sections uh, for three different colleges um, ready to go. Each section will have a student success coach in addition to the instructor whose job it will be to help students with tasks like studying, test taking, time management, um, effective reading, all kinds of other skills that we like to give um, students who, who we think may not be as, as quite as prepared as we would like for the rigors of college studies. Uh, the courses will begin on July 19th, so the last three week section of summer. And they'll cost only $25 a credit, which was a big selling point. We wanted just enough of a fee to put some skin in the game. But other than that, we really wanted it to be nominal. Uh, the first spots, since we can't offer it to everybody, will be offered to first time freshmen from West Virginia counties that had a retention rate lower than the university's average. The university's average was 82% last fall. So we're reaching out to all students from counties that had a lower than 82% retention rate at West Virginia University. Um, we're gonna try to boost those, boost those retention rates and keep more students from those counties that, that haven't you know, particularly tracked all that well. Um, Extension also is planning to provide in-person support in those counties when possible. So altogether, it's taken a little bit longer to put together than I hoped, but since the high schools just let out, oh, May 28th, so not too long ago, uh, we aren't too far along for the July 9th, I mean, uh, July launch. So let me know if you have any questions, and other than that, enjoy your summer. Thanks so much, Evan, and again, I'm really pleased that this was an idea that came out of Senate and that we were able to, to act on that so quickly. So um, keep those good ideas coming. Um, a bit about fall planning. Um, I will tell you that the uh, return to campus, I mean, our plans haven't changed since we last met. Although I will tell you that um, there was a bit of a lull in conversations that is starting to pick up again as we look ahead to fall. I know that the Health and Safety Committee, which has uh, faculty representation, is going to start really taking a serious look at things like uh, vaccines and the masking requirements. Um, you know, the winds of change in higher ed are, are really uh, blowing in the direction of more openness. So I will tell you that, um, and you probably know this already, that many universities are lifting their, their mask mandates um, and um, basically putting that responsibility on the individual to get vaccinated. Um, Penn State's about to announce uh, the end of June that they are lifting all their mask, their mask mandates, um, only requiring them if students are vaccinated and they're not requiring vaccines. So just kind of give you a, a heads up on what uh, kind of the way the wind is blowing. But again, nothing has changed dramatically. There's an email that's going to go out tomorrow to staff um, really focused more on um, if you're working remotely, some of those uh, expectations and support systems that'll be into place. So stay tuned. Um, and of course, we'll keep you updated. Um, academic transformation, we've made some very good progress on the initiative. Uh, first of all, I'll talk a little bit about program portfolio review. Um, this is a process in which we were looking at every undergraduate major and um, terminal master's degree programs um, to, uh, you know, applying the same criteria, program criteria, what we call gold standard criteria for a first level review. Um, through this process, we identified more than 30 degree programs for further review. 
These are programs that appear to be struggling in some way, um, either because of enrollment challenges or retention issues, graduation rates. Um, in some cases, uh, these programs were at the bottom of the quintile of all academic programs. We also identified programs that had growth potential that may need some additional uh, investment to increase capacity. So that's, that's a real positive. We shared our data and our analysis with the deans of these colleges um, at the beginning of May, and they have been meeting with their chairs who will be presumably sharing with the faculty in their units if they haven't already. We are collecting additional data and information from each of these units, and that information will be due on September 1st. Um, and some of the colleges are actually coordinating the, the collection of that information. Once we analyze the additional data and narratives, we will make preliminary recommendations, which the units can appeal through a formal appeal process that is outlined in our BOG rules. And that will be the appropriate time for us to share that uh, with the larger community because we will actually then be making these preliminary recommendations. I think it's really important to note that not all academic um, majors and programs identified for further review will be reduced or sunset. Um, in fact, it may be that these programs are already addressing these concerns and will have an improvement plan that they will share with us. And in other cases, they may be asked to provide an improvement plan. But I just think, you know, that, that there are going to be a smaller number of programs that in the end um, are going to be recommended for either reduction or um, elimination. Um, a bit on academic restructuring, you know, this continues to be an, an area of consideration. As I'm sure you're all aware, two weeks ago, we announced the merger of the College of Education and Human Services with the College of Physical Activity and Sports Sciences into a brand new college yet to be named. Now, while this is a pretty significant change for the university, the pairing of such units is fairly common according to our national benchmarking research. And we believe it will be beneficial in the long run, um, not just because of potential cost savings, but also because it brings together the unique strengths of each unit and it creates a new platform for collaboration in high interest areas such as health and wellness education, youth development and mental health counseling. While this decision may have seemed sudden to some, um, it's actually been a, a point of discussion for many years and actually faculty uh, and staff in both units, many of them were aware that this was a possibility um, and, and ha had a lot of anxiety about when such a decision would be made. Academic transformation really accelerated our look at this and our decision to bring these two colleges together to form a powerful new college. Uh, next steps for this process, the administrative teams from both colleges will begin to work together this summer to identify what the structure will look like. Then we anticipate that committees will be assigned in the fall to focus on the various aspects of the merger, including things like curriculum, student support services, promotion and tenure, and so on. There will be a great deal of opportunity for stakeholders, especially faculty and staff, to have a say in what this new college will look like and how it will operate. Um, and, and we're excited about how these two colleges come together um, to creatively imagine what the future will look like. Ideally, we'd like to conduct a search for the new founding dean in early spring and to have the college established by fall of 22, recognizing that many things are gonna take more than a year to, to resolve. So things like promotion tenure might take two or three years um, and we recognize that, but we wanna be able to, to, to move quickly on this. The time is right um, and, uh, and we have momentum on our side. Um, and then finally, also under the umbrella of academic transformation, this summer my team will begin to, uh, will be working to identify our next set of priorities for next year. Um, that will become the focus of our work during the next calendar year. And I do know that a, an even uh, more intense look at student success will be part of that because we do know retention um, is extremely important um, for the university and uh, we still have room in which to grow that uh, or, or to increase our retention and persistence rates. 
And that is my report. Okay, thank you. Other questions for the provost? Okay, I see uh, one question, one hand from uh, Senator Asad Dabari. Asad, go ahead. Uh, Asad Dabari from Beckley campus. I'm referring to those 30 programs that uh, you said they are for further review. Is it from all main campus or any of them from other campuses? This is just main campus. It doesn't include a Potomac State or Beckley or Health Sciences. Thanks. Okay, I see another hand. Uh, Highland Lee, go ahead. No, I don't have a question. Yep. I know I show up. Sorry. Yep, no problem. Oh, you don't have a question. Okay. Can you lower that hand, please? Thank you. Other questions for the provost? Comments? I see one in the comments. Okay, Heather Billings, go ahead, Senator Billings. Hi, Heather Billings from School of Medicine. Um, I'd like to just, it's more of a, a request for consideration rather than a question, but as sure. we're talking about uh, potentially lifting the mask mandates, to keep in mind that we, until we have had sufficient vaccination rates to reach herd immunity across campus, we will have students and faculty and staff, you know, people on campus who are unable to get vaccinated for medical reasons or who are vaccinated and are not fully protected because of uh, their immunocompromised in some way for, because of other health conditions. And that I think we should uh, take into consideration the potential ableism of having to make them request accommodations or something to, to have people wearing Absolutely. masks around them. Uh, and just please take that into consideration as we consider that. Absolutely, Heather. So um, a question in the um, comments about the mask mandate too. Um, uh, you had mentioned Provost, um, uh, winds of change, and this person's asking, what are the, what are exactly are those winds of change um, towards moving the removing the mask mandate? Uh, and there's the, the latest CDC guidance is that institutions of higher education that do not require COVID vaccinations should one maintain physical distancing measures and two maintain mask requirements. Is that Scott? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that looks like okay. Scott. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, Scott. Um, what I'm saying is winds of change is, is what we're hearing from other institutions of higher ed. And what we're seeing, um, we're seeing other universities, many that are starting to lift their mask mandates. Um, and I know the report that Scott is referring to, um, and I'm not, I'm not defending uh, any decision that hadn't been made yet. I'm just sharing with you that, that this seems to be what we're seeing happening around the country. And again, Penn State, you know, our largest I don't say competitor, but you know, major major player in Pennsylvania is lifting its mask mandate at the end of uh, June. Other, thank you. Are there other questions or comments? Okay, so we will move on then to my report. My report is also um, very very short. So Senate committee chairs submitted their annual reports to the executive committee. And those reports will be presented at the September Senate meeting. Um, and, and we do things that way because the reports kind of outline what ha had happened in the past year and um, also kind of project forward with goals. And so it's, it's, um, it's useful because there is a turnover of Senate. This is the last meeting for a lot of people. And um, the kind of new folks get to see the reports um, without having to dig into the archives and, uh, and can kind of see what's on the horizon for the Senate ahead. Um, prior to that September meeting, our incoming chair, Ashley Martucci, and our chair-elect Scott Wayne, and I as past chair will be hosting an intro to faculty Senate. Uh, and this meeting is the audience is primarily new senators, although anybody's welcome to attend. Uh, and at that meeting, we'll discuss what the Senate is, its role at the institution, uh, the Senate organizational structure, and senator responsibilities. So watch your emails for dates and times for that meeting. Typically, we've um, held it just before that first meeting, so in that kind of 45 minutes to an hour before the first Senate meeting. So um, as the president mentioned, the 
planning for the um, revived country roads tour continues. And um, uh, I don't have anything firm to tell anyone yet, but, um, but folks can be, uh, can expect emails, um, email invitations um, shortly, uh, if, if you expressed interest. So uh, the, lastly, I'll just say that, um, that I did say my final goodbyes and my thanks preemptively um, at the last meeting and uh, you know I, I won't uh, I won't rehash anything I'll, I'll just say thanks again um, and that it's been um, uh, uh, a uh, well it's been an, uh, an honor and a privilege to serve you and um, and I appreciate the, the trust that you've put in to me so that concludes my final report uh, are there any questions or comments Okay, so we will move on then to the curriculum committee report from uh, Chen Chair Jennifer Steele. Are you ready? Jennifer? Yes, I'm ready. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm in a bit of a low bandwidth environment here. So, okay, I have uh, four items for approval today and one information item. Um, new courses report is Annex 1 course changes Annex 2, uh, capstone courses Annex 3, and then, there, then changes to the computer engineering program at WV Tech. Those are the four approval items. Okay. And I'll take any questions if you have them. Are there questions about the uh, four approval items, the annexes? Questions about them? Okay. So we will combine the four, uh, four approval items into a single votable measure. So all those in favor of approving Annex 1, the new course report, Annex 2, the course changes report, Annex 3, the capstone courses report, and the changes to computer engineering, to the computer engineering program at WVUIT, please raise your hands. Okay, um, I'm gonna close the vote. Dave, would you mind indicating? Oh, thank you very much. So 75 votes and then Julie, will you lower the hands? 75 yes votes, you can see that in the chat. Hands are being lowered. Okay, uh, any opposed? I'm closing the vote. Okay, so um, the annexes are approved. Okay, and I have one information item and that is changes to the minor in Africana studies. And that is all I have. Are there any questions about the four information item? Okay, then we'll move on. Next is our uh, General Education Foundations Committee report from Chair Lisa D. Bartolomeo. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Annex 4 presents uh, two courses new to the Jeff. So we have BUS 191, Intro to Business, New Jeff 4, and MUSC 151, Hip Hop Nation, which sounds amazing. Uh, also a new Jeff course for Jeff 4. Those are presented for approval and I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions about Annex 4? Okay, so all those in favor of approving Annex 4, please raise your hand. Uh, I'm closing the vote. OK, 
Okay, that's 82 yes votes for Annex 4. Julie, can you lower the rest of the hands, please? Are there any, uh, oh, could you lower the little one? There we go. Are there any opposed? Please raise your hand. Okay, I'm closing the vote. All right, so Annex 4 is approved. Next, we have our Teaching and Assessment Committee report from uh, the chair of that committee, Jessica Vanderhoff. Jessica, are you ready? Yes, thank you, Natalie. I have two items for approval and two items for information. Um, Annex 5 is with regard to the early semester teaching calendar for the fall semester. And Annex 6 is um, uh, a recommendation to modify the ESCI scale. Um, I'll take any questions related to those two attachments. Are there questions for Jessica about Annexes 5 and Annex 6? Okay, so uh, I'm going to combine the two annexes into a single votable measure. So all of those in favor of approving annexes five and six, please raise your hand. Okay, I'm um, closing the vote. I see that there are two hands under attendees. Are those senators who need to be moved over? Maybe Morgan or Julie? In any case, we're just gonna count the folks who are currently listed as panelists. So I will uh, close the vote. Okay, and then can you lower the hands? What, 78? Great. Uh, any opposed? Please raise your hand. Okay, I'm going to close the vote. So annexes um, five and six are approved. And then you've got your two, four information items. Yes, happy to answer any questions. Annex 7 um, is just the email reminder uh, out to faculty that we will be doing the uh, batch upload of the syllabi from digital measures into the library's research repository um, on or around July 1st. And this second for information is just the summary of the early semester teaching assessment participation um, from the spring semester. Okay. Are there uh, any questions about those two items? Okay, thanks. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, moving on, a report from faculty representative to state government, Roy Nutter. And this is this will be your final report as well. It will indeed. And, uh... It's, it's been a long run. Thank you very much. Uh, Roy Nutter, Statler College. The uh, faculty across West Virginia have been relatively quiet. That shouldn't surprise anyone for the last month uh, with school out. So not much uh, going on. The legislature, however, is uh, meeting in an interim session uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And that what they're doing is mostly um, allocating federal funds to uh, next year's budgeting for uh, a number of things. None of them that I found seem to affect um, higher education. So um, that completes my report. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Roy? I, I see a comment. Did you see, did you see the comment in the chat, Roy? 
Thank you for your many, many years of excellent service and for representing us so well. I could not agree more. Okay. Parviz, go ahead, I see your hand. Yes, I just wanna echo that. Um, when I was a faculty senate chair, I asked Roy to serve in that position. That was about 15 years ago, right? And I really appreciate what you've done. I thought you were the right person at, for this position from the WVU faculty standpoint. And thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Okay, great. All, and so next we have our Board of Governors report from Stan Heilman. Stan, are you ready? Yep, uh, we haven't had a meeting since our last Faculty Senate meeting. We did have a special board meeting on May 20th. That was simply to approve some changes that are coming regarding food-centered options on campus. Uh, there's several of those in Evansdale, the Mountain Lair, uh, the market out here at the Health Sciences, as well as Lion Tower, and that we paid out of uh, the Sodexo Capital Fund. And our next uh, normal or general board meeting will be held on June 25th, where Emily and I, as well as some others, will be presenting our faculty uh, report to the board. And that's my report. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Stan? Lisa, I see your hand. Lisa DiBartolomeo. Go ahead. Hi, Lisa DiBartolomeo, Herbili College of Arts and Sciences. Um, and in the past, we, we've we asked faculty to attend that meeting. I'm not sure whether this one will be in person or on Zoom. Would you like folks to attend to support you and Emily and to offer additional uh, comments or, or anything like that? Let us know if it would be helpful. So let, let me check with Valerie because we did have our last board meeting in person, but attendance might be limited. So um, let me check with Valerie and see if that's something that we can do. Always appreciate it. Thanks for that question. Other questions? Okay. So on to item 10, which is a four information item, just list the results of the executive committee election. So these, uh, the folks listed there will be serving on the executive committee for the upcoming year. And um, those positions are uh, just one year positions. So if, are there um, uh, any questions regarding Annex 9? Is there any new business? I, I see your hand, um, Marianne Downs, Senator Downs, go ahead. Hi, Marianne Downs, uh, School of Medicine. I sent a open letter to uh, the faculty that was distributed this morning. Um, and I just wanted to recognize while there may be changes on the horizon that we'll find out about as we move through the summer into the fall, at the time, at this time, especially those of us who teach in the fall, I know there was an e-news published on May 25th updating the mask mandate, wearing an out-of-state travel guidance uh, that stated explicitly that while allowing or that um, stated uh, fully vaccinated individuals who are in groups of fewer than 10 indoors on campus may decide as a group to remove masks and every individual must feel comfortable with that decision. Otherwise, everyone should continue to wear masks in that setting. And with that, I felt some discomfort because I could imagine the conversations that would take place either in asking people if they feel comfortable, asking people if they're vaccinated, that in the ensuing conversation as to why are you not comfortable or why are you not vaccinated that may lead to especially students being more vulnerable when they're facing a faculty member just by that power dynamic feeling very uncomfortable in disclosing information whether that be their immune status whether that be their um, hiv status whether that be their uh, decision to get a vaccine or not that may create an unequal and unfair 
an even discriminatory derogative environment. And so I'm just asking the faculty to take consideration and consider those viewpoints and their role and mission as they are creating their uh, campus environments where they are responsible for creating that campus environment. Thank you. Um, uh, would anyone like to um, share their thoughts or comment in any way? Okay, I see one hand, Parviz from, from Maureen. Yes, yeah, thank you for your email. And, and I agree with, with what the email had to say. Uh, but at some point, we have to make that transition to, I know we're never gonna be in a normal life again, but to that semi-normal life. And we have so many faculty senators from health sciences that maybe they could advise the administration of how to do this transition. And, and, and because at some point we have to do the transition. But thank you for your email. Thanks. Other questions or comments? Looks like, uh, okay, so I see your hand. Junix, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I read Marianne's email with interest earlier today. And um, I agree that there's, I mean, we need some sort of guidance to, to allow to help people handle the potential situations that are going to occur. And uh, without going into specifics, um, one of my research groups, you know, we're all on the same floor of the same building and everybody's happy to, to, to not have to wear masks anymore. But we have one, one student that, um, you know, is in the mix that is not vaccinated. And it's like, how, how do we, you know, how do we don't want to, we can't tell the student to get vaccinated. Um, we also don't want to alienate the student and say, well, you, you know, you can't come to work because the rest of us don't want to wear masks. So it's good it's going to be quite awkward. So there needs to be some guidance. I mean, I, I for one, was happy to see um, the, the, the announcement that came out. Um, but yeah, I could foresee these situations happening all over campus. And, um, you know, for me, it's not going to happen in classes because my classes are large enough that we're not going to be able to take our masks off. But, but um, you know, with research groups and and any sort of, um, I don't know, any study groups or anything like that. I mean, it could it could get very awkward. And, you know, even students on students could say, hey, well, nine out of the 10 of us are vaccinated. Why aren't you? And I mean, it could cause some problems. So I don't know how we handle it. I don't have an answer, but I think somebody smarter than me needs to think about it and, and give some guidance. Thank so you. Thank you, Marianne, for that. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Emily Murphy, I see your hand raised. So I, yeah, I just have a comment. I thought that the um, allow, allowing us to not wear masks in groups of 10 was only with faculty and staff and did not include students. So I was wondering if somebody from the provost office could clarify that. Yeah, at this point, and I think we had, we had discussed this at exec, at this point, the guidance is for meetings, um, not for the classroom. So um, that's, that's with our current, our current guidelines. Um, I, I actually, I just have a, a, a question that's following up on um, Drew Nix's question, and, and that is, uh, it's for the provost as well, and uh, do, will that guidance come in part from that um, health and safety committee? Yeah, absolutely. So that, that you know, I think I heard, I think it was, um, I heard someone say, um, that we need to have faculty and from health sciences weigh in. I mean, that we have the health and safety committee, um, you know, which includes faculty from both health sciences and the main campus, as well as, as other um, administrators and leaders. And so no decisions that we will make and no decisions that we have made to date are not made without their, 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 them weighing in um, and advising. Thank you. Um, for that clarification. 
Uh, there are some comments in the chat. Um, I would, before I take those, like to see if there's anybody else who would like to speak on the floor. Okay, so the comments in the chat then are um, in response to Marianne Downs, um, the potential for negative peer pressure in small groups is also an issue. So kind of affirming what she had written. Um, next, uh, do we foresee that when the FDA uh, fully approves a vaccine, we will mandate it to faculty, students, and staff? So that's a question for the um, provost and the president. Gordon, do you want to weigh in? I don't know if Gordon is still on the. I saw him. Cool. I, I would just. Uh, say, so I was sitting. Okay. I was sitting there talking to myself. Okay. Anyway, um, well, you know, I think that uh, I think that we haven't really um, we haven't really come to that conclusion yet um, because of the fact that uh, you know the the world is changing almost dramatically every day. I guess, I guess, I guess my 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 view is that um, is that uh, right now it's a matter of it's a matter of choice for everyone. If if you're concerned about getting the virus, then get the damn da vaccine. That's just that that's just it. You know, as I said, the the the, the results are that ninety nine point nine percent of uh, people are immune once they have the vaccine, and we're going to have a booster shot in the fall apparently from both Moderna and Pfizer. So, uh, so the imposition, the imposition of, uh, of, of a vaccine rule when you have the choice to uh, take a vaccine um, seems to me to be something that we'd have to think about carefully, but we just, haven't, we just haven't really discussed that and haven't decided that yet. And we'll do it with our, with our best, um, with our best uh, advice from our uh, health experts, clearly, but it has not yet been approved. And I think that that has been one of the issues about reluctance. I run into that um, on occasion within the university. I'll ask people, you know, someone in my office, have you been vaccinated? Well, most, most people in my office have been, but a couple of people have said they're just reluctant because it hasn't been approved yet. And so I think we have that problem. Okay. I can, Natalie, if I can, I can, I can just add to that what, what Gordon yeah. said. Um, we had a leadership COVID meeting earlier this morning, and it was discussed that Moderna and Pfizer have both submitted to the FDA for approval. And so it was discussed that when those approvals come, the university will need to review its position on this, on potentially requiring a vaccine. We are aware of it, and we are prepared to discuss it again. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a couple additional questions in the chat on, uh, I think these questions are regarding um, that May 25th email and groups that can get together. Uh, so this question is, graduate students are employees, so they would be included, correct? And, uh, and then uh, kind of a co connected is, does this include meetings with students? So Provost Reed, could you answer? Yeah. I, and I'll do my best. My understanding is that this was primarily about meetings. If you have meetings with students that are meetings, graduate students, but this was not meant to be um, an answer to the classroom situation. So um, if we need further clarification on that, I'll make sure that we, that we do that. Okay, thank you. Are there uh, any other questions or comments regarding this issue? Okay, I see one additional item of new business um, from Margaret Mittlenberger, who is asking, uh, she says she's a representative from WVU Extension. Um, she, the WVU Extension, it sounds like, would like for the Faculty Welfare Committee in conjunction with ACF to consider decreasing the retirement eligibility requirement from 30 years to 25 or 20 years. Uh, we understand it is a WVU higher education policy, but want to just discuss, want to the discussion maybe to be started. Okay, so that's something for the welfare committee to 
to take up next year. Okay. Um, Frankie Tack, I see your hand. Go ahead. Thanks, Frankie Tack, College of Education Human Services. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I, there are a group of us um, under the leadership of Carrie Valentine as a spinoff from the DEI committee, although I am not on the DEI committee. So this group has just sort of an ad hoc group that um, began meeting after the concerns with the SEIs that were brought up in last month's meeting. And um, as this group has continued to work, um, you know, there are pieces to this that we will bring in the fall, but for immediate consideration in this cycle um, that will be going into for faculty evaluation, um, this ad hoc group, and by the way, Carrie's on vacation and the other members, of the DEI committee who were part of this ad hoc group that's been working were not able to be present today. Um, and that's why I'm um, doing this. Um, I'm going to drop into the chat, I guess, or or should it be the Q&A, Natalie? Something that I would like everyone to see. And then make sure it's to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see it. To all panelists and all attendees. OK, there we go. Um, We've crafted a um, optional uh, SEI concern statement that we would like faculty members to consider including in their digital measures narrative this year if they feel so inclined. And there are two versions of it. There is one version for um, BIPOC underrepresented groups and there is another version for people who don't fit into that group or who would prefer to make that statement as an ally. And the statement has some references for the very well documented fact that people of color and women are judged much more harshly on SEIs with the same level of performance than their white male counterparts are. Um, there's a great depth um, that got cut off. Is there a word limit? I'm getting a message. There there. might be. So it ended with, uh, I request. Um, did, was that option one or option two? Um, option, still option one. There's no option, option one. Okay, here's the end of the I request statement. And then I'm going to, option two is very, very similar. It just has some wording that is for people who don't fit that group who are allies. So um, we'd like to put this out as um, something that senators could share within their respective departments as something that if a person has a concern about this or feels as if they would like to stand in solidarity with the fact that SEIs um, have a, a, you know, fairly well documented uh, disproportionate negative effect um, for women and people of color, that that would be there for this to happen in this cycle. Because if we wait, you know, another another cycle, we're you know we're it's a whole another year that's gone by. Um, and can I can I also make a motion, Natalie? Sure. Yep, you can make a motion. Okay, I'd like to make a motion that the Senate endorse um, this statement, not that it be required by any means, but that they endorse that it's a viable way to raise awareness about this um, inequity that's baked into our faculty evaluation system and that that um, is uh, known to chronically negatively affect BIPOC people and women. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Uh, discussion? I was wondering uh, the is there any way to, to send that out? Yeah, could you, could you stay? Yeah, could you? This, I'm sorry. 
I never speak here, so it's the first. This is Heidi Samuels at Potomac State College, and I'm super. I'm just super excited to have have this statement coming out now as the only LGBTQ member on Potomac State campus. Uh, you know, and I've struggled with this the 25 years I've been in higher ed. I'm thrilled to death that something like this is coming out. So uh, e even if it doesn't pass here, can I get a copy of that? And I'll, we can put it in Potomac State fi uh, College's files too. Natalie, um, I will, I'll email it to you. Okay. Okay. And then maybe you can share it broadly. And, and I just want to say that um, there, there doesn't seem to be a depth of research on L LGBTQ, but, but um, the suspicion, of course, is that any kind of, of uh, minority intersectionality or, um, and perception of gender identity and sexual orientation issues probably have a similar effect, but we don't have that, um, those research articles. I think it might be easy. I know folks are asking to see it in an email. It might be easier if um, if this was distributed so folks can look at it more closely. So before there's an endorsement. So it might be that we wait until September to endorse it, but that wouldn't preclude anybody from including something like it in their files if they wanted to. It would just be without Senate endorsement. May, may we vote on endorsement? Because yeah. I, I think it carries a little more weight and some of our senators, I'm just guessing, might feel a little more comfortable taking it to their, their fellow faculty members if they were taking it with a Senate endorsement. So I, see, I see a hand and then I see a comment. So go ahead, Rose. Hi, Rose Casey, Department of English, Eberly College, um, WV Main Campus. Um, I would like us to at least vote on endorsing this now. Um, I personally think it is very important that it gets endorsed sooner rather than later. Um, we have been <laughs> having these conversations about bias in SEIs, uh, discrimination is a stronger and more accurate term, discrimination in SEIs um, for years. Um, we have discussed it all year regularly. Um, so it seems important that we push ahead with it. We push ahead with a vote now. Um, I might suggest that it is tricky to, to potentially read. You, could cut and paste if you're at a computer and read it that way. Um, or we could take an extra few minutes to give people time to read it more thoroughly, um, if that's helpful. Uh, in addition to the PNT comment, um, different departments and programs have different PNT filing dates. Um, I know that in our department, it's September the 4th. Um, I know people who have lost their jobs, even at WVU for reasons that seem to be linked to their SEIs in ways that are often not provable, but that um, it seems clearly linked to SEIs. I know people who have suffered um, the, the discomfort, to put it mildly, of having biased and discriminatory um, SEIs. Uh, uh, and I, I just think that we need to move ahead personally as soon as we can, thanks. Thanks. Emily, go ahead. Um, so I'm uh, sorry. So I was just going to ask is, could we endorse it? But also, and this is maybe a question for Judy, our parliamentarian, could we then send it out? And if there needed to be edits, could we like then vote on the edits through an email vote? Or is there some way that we can, like Rose said, take time to be able to read it so we know what we're voting on? Judy? Well, there is a motion and a second, so it does need to be voted on. Um, I think the only recourse after that, if it's approved and you want to make um, um, edits to it, is that will need to be raised at the next Senate meeting. Okay. But may I add that since this is an option and we are not, uh, the motion is, is I mean, I, th I think everyone has, every faculty member has the right to put in their narrative what they want to put in their narrative. So even if we endorse this as is, if somebody doesn't care for a part of the wording and wants to change that on their own, that's completely within their 
their power. Um, and by the way, Natalie, I did just email it to you. Someone had asked on the chat if I could do that. It's in your, it should be in your inbox. And if you wanted to push it now, um, but I don't, I don't think that this is a, I mean, I think we wanted to, the ad hoc group that has been working on this wanted to put something out there that people could just cut and paste. But if someone doesn't care for a piece of the wording, I think our endorsement still stands. We endorse this statement. If you want to phrase it a different way in your own narrative, I certainly think that's, I mean, we're not trying to control anybody's narrative. We're offering something up that a person could use that's um, uh, sort of turnkey. They wouldn't have to invent on their own. Okay. Um, Parvis Fumori, I see your hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um... I think we should vote, and I think uh, we're in, in information age. And just send it to Judy. Judy will send it to the all at Faculty Senate. It's 4.18 now. It's not like May meeting that we were close to 6 o'clock. Let's just take five minutes, go, and then vote on it. One second. OK. Um, Heidi Samuels, go ahead, please. Thanks. Heidi Samuels, Potomac State College again. So I see in the comments in the chat that I, I see, I'm concerned because I see people getting bogged down and that they're trying to make this too complicated. It seems like a very simple statement you can use or you don't have to use it. If, you know, it, it, it doesn't, it's not something that requires, you know, extensive research on. It's a simple statement. All we're doing is voting on endorsing it as a faculty senate. If you wanna use it, use it. If you don't, don't. I'm just concerned that people are gonna vote no because they want to do extensive research on, you know, they wanna see the results of the, the research and whatnot. And, and I don't think that's necessary to vote to endorse it. That's all. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Okay, Scott Fleming, go ahead. Yeah, I just want a mo moment to um, just to read it. It's one thing to hear somebody say it. I just, I, and I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to the, the, the thought or anything like that, but I think I'd be remiss if I didn't read it before I vote for an endorsement or not. I agree. So I did send it to Judy and um, Judy is, distributing it via email, but I can also share my screen. So I will do both. Okay. Can everyone read that? I can make it bigger if you need me to. Oops, sorry. I want to keep it all on one page. Give you another minute or so. I have to um, stop sharing in order to see all the other screens and such, the chat and the um, the vote count. So I can't keep it up.
All right, never mind. I can keep it up. I'll just make sure I see the chat. There we go. Okay, and I see people are reading it via email. Okay. Um, I, I saw a hand. Is there another? After reading the statement, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, Emily Murphy, I believe this is will be your last time speaking on this. So I just wanted to make sure that you saw Rose's um, comment and she's leaving, but would like to know if she can record her vote, even though she needs to leave the meeting for uh, to pick up her one of her children. And I just want to make sure you saw that comment. Thank you. Okay. If there aren't any more questions or comments, then um, there is a motion on the floor to endorse the optional SEI concern statement. Um, all those in favor of endorsing the statement, please raise your hands. Okay, I'm closing the vote. Looks like I got to 68. Okay, 68 yes votes. Could you lower the hands, please, Judy? Or not Judy or Julie. Um, any opposed? Please raise your hands. Okay, closing the vote. Okay, so the motion to endorse carries. Oh, was there, uh, there might have been one no vote. Okay. Is it, or is that a hand, Drew? That was a delayed yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, got it. All right, is there any additional new business? Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, we're adjourned. <laughs>